Uh, thank you very much, Stephanie, and uh, good morning, everybody, and thanks for the invitation uh, to speak to you today. Uh, so what I'm going to do is give you a very whistle-stop tour through uh, an approach that we're using to assess the impact of the environment on health, and this is using spatially uh, linked data from survey data and then also uh, data um, uh, from various environmental um, exposures. So this is part of work um, that we're doing uh, as part of a research program um, that's funded by uh, the EPA um, and the HSE, looking at a variety of issues around the environment, um, and one component is looking at the interplay between the environment and health. So I suppose that the starting point for this is that um, certainly at the SRI we've had a long interest um, in inequalities and health inequalities. We all know that health is uh, inequitably distributed across the population, uh, and there's a lot of interest in trying to unpick why that um, occurs and thinking about potential solutions. Um, and if you think about, I suppose, the causes of causes and the social determinants of health, uh, which uh, the WHO have published um, extensively on, uh, the physical environment, so our built um, and natural environment, is a really important uh, component of that. Uh, but research linking the environment uh, and health has a long history. So if you think about sort of early research in epidemiology uh, has tried to sort of uh, uncover associations between uh, environmental insults or exposures uh, and health outcomes. So there was a very famous study in the 1850s in London which uh, linked a cholera outbreak uh, to uh, a defective water pump, for example. Um, but there's real methodological challenges in trying to look at these associations and, you know, I, I mention associations because it's really difficult to try and unpick causality here. Uh, often when we look at associations between environment um, and health outcomes or health and well-being outcomes, we're looking at sort of very uh, aggregated uh, regional um, uh, or spatial um, areas, but there's a lot that goes under the skin there that we just can't observe. Um, there's also reasons uh, to do with, for example, selection into different areas. So, for example, those of us that have higher income or higher education, we can choose to live in areas that have better environment, um, environmental exposures. And trying to unpick those different uh, factors is really difficult. Um, so the method and the approach that we use um, is trying to, I suppose, overcome some of those challenges. Um, so what we do is we link spatially coded individual level microdata, and the data that I'm going to show you today is from, uh, from TILDA, the Irish Longitudinal Study on Aging, which, which Stephanie mentioned, uh, and we link that with similarly spatially coded data um, on various environmental um, exposures. And the environmental exposure data that we have linked into TILDA to date um, is data on radon risk, so from the EPA's radon risk map. Um, and also data on green and blue spaces, and we're working at present uh, to link in data um, on noise. Okay, so um, over the last couple of years, we've been working on this um, with the support of the EPA um, and HSE, and we've, uh, we've looked at a number of different issues. So we started by looking at the association between radon risk um, and lung cancer, um, and this was a paper that was published earlier this year. Um, and what we found was that there was indeed, as you would expect, an association between radon risk um, in your area, uh, uh, in the area in which you live, um, and the probability that you've had a lung cancer diagnosis. But I suppose quite uh, slightly unexpectedly, we found that the association wasn't linear, um, and that actually it was people in the high, but not the highest levels of radon exposure that had the highest probability of lung cancer. Uh, and there's a number of reasons why you might expect that. One is survivor bias. Um, lung cancer is a really deadly um, form of cancer. There's also issues potentially then around um, mitigation um, and I suppose steps that individuals and households have taken to reduce their radon risk. Um, the next piece of work then that we looked at was um, linking in data on um, green and blue spaces um, into TILDA. And obviously this is an area that's starting to become uh, much more um, researched. And what we looked at was the association between urban green space um, and obesity on the one hand, and then also looking at the association between coastal blue space um, and mental uh, health on the other hand. So what I'm going to talk to you today is about the urban green space and obesity paper as a kind of an illustration of the approach that we've taken. Um, the coastal blue space and depression work is um, uh, it's up as a poster um, in the session here, so you can have a look at it over lunch or over coffee break. But interestingly, what we found there, to give you a flavour, is that um, it's not so much your proximity to coastal blue space that matters um, for depression risk, but it's actually the visibility of it. So if you can see... 
um, uh, coastal blue space. So we are hypothesizing there that it's, I suppose, the mental health benefits associated with blue space operate through a sort of a visual um, channel rather than a simple sort of being close to and accessible and using it for, for example, for physical activity. So, as I mentioned, this is the paper that, and the piece of work that I'm going to focus on um, for the rest of the talk. Um, so, I suppose, why focus on this? And I suppose I don't have to convince this audience here as to why we're interested in this. Um, we all know that uh, the world's population is increasingly living in urban areas. Um, it's over half at the moment. It'll grow to two-thirds by 2050. Um, and in that context, there's an increasing um, interest in the health and well-being effects associated with increasing urbanization. Um, obesity um, is a major public health concern. Um, it's associated with numerous uh, chronic uh, illnesses and also many forms um, of cancer. Um, but there's a lot of discussion um, in both the scientific uh, uh, literature around the causes of obesity. Um, in terms of the economics literature, there's a bit more in terms of uh, certainty in terms of the consequences, for example, for things in terms of labour market outcomes, um, but much less um, uh, certainty in terms of the causes. And I think some of you here may be aware of that uh, hugely complicated map that tries to um, map out the, the causes of obesity. Um, but there is an increasing focus on environmental factors and specifically the role of obesogenic uh, environments. So these are, I suppose, the way our environments are, are, are laid out and how are those factors, for example, what type of food outlets are around, how much green and blue space, footpaths, public transport, how that facilitates or not um, uh, um, behaviours that might be conducive um, to lower obesity and overweight. Um, so what we do in this paper is we link tilde data with data on green space exposure from the EU uh, Urban Atlas. So I'll describe these two data sets uh, in turn. So tilde is, um, and I suppose the big advantage of it from, from this perspective is that it's a nationally representative study of the over 50s. Um, it's also longitudinal as well, so we follow the same people uh, repeatedly through time. Uh, so the first tilde participants were surveyed in, in 2010, uh, so coming up now in 10 years. And they've been surveyed two years ever since. Um, so we're currently nearing the end of wave five of data collection and preparing for wave six in 2020. It covers, I suppose, the, the vast array of information about individuals' lives, not just economics, social, but also uh, for our purposes, um, a real uh, strength is the strength of the and the breadth of the health information that's in uh, TILDA. The data are collected in a number of different ways, face-to-face -face interviews, as you'd expect, self-completion questionnaires, which are important for more sensitive information, and much of that sensitive information uh, we use in terms of, for example, mental health, um, but also, interestingly, as well, from clinical health assessments. Um, and this is important, particularly if you're looking at outcomes, for example, to do with alcohol consumption um, or um, obesity, um, where we have actual clinical assessments. There's about 8,000 um, observations at baseline, um, and about 85 90% of people stay in um, as each wave uh, occurs. Um, so the data on green space exposure then um, comes from the EU Urban Atlas. Um, and what happens here is that satellite imagery um, is used to create highly detailed land use maps um, of urban areas within the EU. Um, and these areas within Ireland broadly correspond to the five major urban uh, areas. So what we do is we, um, we need some sort of um, idea of the, the area around each residence in Tilda. So we draw a 1.6 kilometre buffer around each Tilda residence. Um, this uh, 1.6 kilometre buffer has been used in previous research at a spatial level uh, in, in Ireland and it broadly corresponds to about a 20 minute walk. Um, and we calculate the greenness of the locality as the share of green space um, within this buffer zone as a proportion of the total land, um, uh, uh, land area within that buffer zone. Um, importantly here, obviously, because we're linking to survey data, we have to protect the anonymity of respondents, um, and we divide um, uh, the um, proportions into quintiles, um, so we get uh, um, increasing levels of, of green space as we move up the quintiles. So this is what it looks like um, for Dublin, for example. So you can see, even within the Dublin city and county area, there's still quite a lot of, of green space. So you can see, I'm not sure whether this works. Oh, yes, OK. So you've got the Phoenix Park, for example. This is Dublin Airport. So 
you know, there's quite a lot of variation that we can leverage here um, in terms of green space exposure, and we've done that then for the other uh, four urban areas. Okay, so in terms of the results, um, what do we find? Um, so I suppose as we expect, we find that individuals who have the least amount um, of green space in urban areas um, have a significantly higher um, uh, level um, of obesity than those that are living in sort of middling areas of green space exposure. But I suppose unexpectedly what we found was that those living in areas that have um, more green space um, also have higher risks um, of obesity. And I suppose this was unexpected. Now what we've done here is we've, we've obviously tried to control for as many observable differences between individuals living in these areas. So one concern when you look at this is that there are certain characteristics associated with the individuals living in these areas that might explain this finding. So for example, Maybe people who live in the fourth and fifth quintile of green space exposure um, have lower levels of education, lower income, and other characteristics that are also associated with a higher risk of obesity. The advantage of TILDA is that we can try and control for as many of those observable differences as possible. So even when we do that, we still see this U-shaped relationship. So I suppose we've, this is what's um, got us starting to think about possible next steps in this. Um, and I suppose the, the one um, drawback of the, the way we set up the analysis initially is that we simply looked at um, the, I suppose, different levels of green space exposure um, across these different areas, but we've no way of knowing anything about the accessibility of that green space. So if you look at people who are living in the higher quintiles of green space exposure, it tends to be green space that's sort of farmland or wetlands, which you could um, expect would be less accessible than things like urban parks, for example, and maybe less conducive to physical activity, which in turn may uh, reduce obesity risk. So what we're doing at the moment in terms of the extension of the program is using data from the OSI's Prime 2, which has um, detailed information, for example, on the footpath network to map that in to see if that potentially explains some of the association that we're seeing. Um, we're also working then, sorry, five seconds, with um, UCD colleagues, so Enda Murphy and Owen Douglas um, in uh, UCD, to look at the association between noise exposure in urban areas um, and health and well-being. Um, and one, uh, I suppose, particularly interesting mediator here is um, sleep. Um, and then we're also investigating the feasibility of using other survey microdata. Obviously, the tilde population is an older population. We would like to be able to say something about um, other age groups. So we're currently in discussions with um, the Healthy Ireland team about the possibility um, of linking these environmental exposures to, to Healthy Ireland data. So thank you very much.